and loads of questions coming in here, Katrina, actually. And uh, one from our colleague, Jim Smith here. Can you talk, Katrina, about the importance of securing, he says, preserving and affording appropriate access to archives, that's personal records and administrative files, both held by various church organizations related to the provision of care related services to the vulnerable in Irish society. Services, as Jim points out, invariably paid for and regulated by the state. Should such material be considered private archival material? Well, I've been saying for many years now that the Catholic Church was a shadow state in this country. Uh, they ran health, education and institutional care through industrial schools, mountain laundries and mother and baby homes. And we're now still reeling from the publication of the mother and baby homes report, which seems to have decided that survivor's testimony is not all that important. It's a shocking kick in the teeth for the 600 plus people who came in to talk to them about their own experiences. Um, really shameful. Um, yes, the records of the religious congregations who ran what were effectively public services in this country should be made public records. Mm. I don't know of any politician who has the, the, the appetite or the guts to take that on and ask for it. One way that I've suggested in the past is since they are required to pay uh, restitution for the horrors that were inflicted on people in industrial schools, mountain laundries and mother and baby homes, and they have not paid anything like what they should have paid for, say, the, the industrial schools redress scheme, could this be made part of the redress scheme? Can you give us your records? They matter hugely to people who survived those places, but they are also an integral part of the social history of 19th and 20th century Ireland. We don't get to understand this country unless we get the records, particularly of the Catholic Church, because they were tied into so many things. Um, Jacinta Pronti, who I'm a great admirer of, wrote a marvellous congregational history of the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of Refuge, who ran two industrial schools and two of the biggest Magdalene laundries in Dublin, High Park and Sean McDermott Street. And the records read through her very long book on the whole thing are absolute treasure trove. I mean, all kinds of stuff. French nuns coming to Ireland in the 1840s, mm. fighting with the Archbishop, setting up their different organisations, fundraising, uh, attracting young women from Irish families to join their order. The whole business of Irish families and their, their, their interconnection with the church through, for example, um, having a nun or a priest in your family. I mean, I had a relative who was a Carmelite nun. It was a delightful woman. Her favorite pastime was watching Formula One racing on the television. Who would have thought it? Um, but, you know, unless we have those records, we do not know. And that's a separate issue, if you like from the absolute right of people who went through these, these terrible places to have information about what happened to them and about their identities, which have been kept for them for far too long. Now, hopefully, as a result of the fallout from the Mother and Baby Home Report, they will get access to that information through the new adoption and tracing bill. But we've been there before. And the idea that you can't get your birth certificate in the 21st oh. century, heartbreaking. So yeah, I can, Jim is, uh, has asked the right question as he always does. And that is my view on the matter. I have made no secret of it. Uh, I can't see any ministers beating down the path to my door to see if we can organize some way to do it. But we have to keep banging the drum. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, you've talked elsewhere, Katrina, about the idea that almost the creation of a national repository of institutional records is is one way of approaching all the different issues of this. I mean, also that's clearly a critical idea in building up the archival history of the orders that their role, as you say, kind of running a host of kind of institutions that their fingers are very deep. What do you think need to be done to make that happen? Well, there's interesting discussion at the moment about using the, the, the old Sean McDermott Street uh, laundry and convent are still there. The laundry is gone but the convent is still there. And New Productions, one of my favorite theater companies, did an astonishing event there in 2011 where, you know, one, three members of an audience at a time came in and they took you through the experience of being in, working in the laundry there and, and what happened. Uh, and there's talk of that there was a, a protest, a very serious protest against selling that site to a Japanese hotel who wanted to buy it. It's now been accepted that it should be a memorial site, but part of that is to make an archival uh, repository there too. Now, it's not clear yet how that might work out, 
uh, it may become a, a place where, where survivors can leave testimonies that they would like to be in the open rather than locked away for many years. Um, it may, if anyone ever does get it together, or if the church itself has a change of heart on this matter, be a place where those institutional records can be lodged. But at any rate, some of the, 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 the state records, of which there are many, uh, relating to industrial schools and modern baby homes, could be copied, digitized, and put in there into a reading room where people can look at these things as a coherent set of records. So th there are endless possibilities. It's, it's a very good choice as a place to do it because of its, uh, its obvious emotional connection with, with women in the past. Right. Uh, a series of specific questions here, uh, Katrina, about um, the Land Commission records. Isabella Courtney, I see, uh, Raymond Turl and uh, Owen O'Sullivan, admiring your work, of course, uh, Owen, and just wondering what your thoughts are about the costs and complexities of opening up the Land Commission records might, might be. And... Uh, mm -hmm. um, basically. They should be open. It's against the law to have them shot. It's ridiculous. I mean, ugh. The, the Land Commission had its own special repository, a concrete special built repository at the back of what is now the Marion Hotel. The Land Commission was in those buildings on Marion Street that are now gorgeous places for afternoon tea and a glass of champagne if you're interested. Um, and when that was sold, the building was sold to whoever built that hotel. Uh, there was panic because they were going to pull down the beautiful concrete repository at the back and destroy all the records. So we in the National Archives had to step in and mount a, a fire brigade operation to rescue the records, stick them into our warehouse at the back of Bishop Street on very ramshackle shelving. But I mean, I had a wonderful archivist who I must name called Una Wark from the north of Ireland who took on that project and did a fantastic job of making sure everything was where it should be. But this is another treasure trove, another major gap that we're missing. What was the biggest issue all along land. And we are not able to evaluate that. We have to remember while we're all going on about 1916 and the War of Independence and the Civil War, behind everyone's back during that time, from the, the establishment of the Land Commission in 1891 to 1922, 75% of the land of Ireland was transferred from landlord to tenant. If that isn't a revolution, tell me what is. Again, a conservative revolution. It created a small holding Catholic peasant society that feeds directly into the Catholic Church's desire for sexual probity and respectability and all of those things. So that, that's another story. But all of those records are there, including the deeds from the original estates that were transferred back to tenants later on, some of which go back to the 15th century, which is, you know, crucial in terms of filling gaps left by what was destroyed in the four courts in 1922. So, yeah, I mean, Terry Dooley, for example, Professor Terry Dooley has been fighting about this for years, trying desperately to get them to open up the stuff, and they won't. And actually, what somebody needs to do is go to court about it and just say, right, if you won't open them up voluntarily, you are breaking the law. Under the National Archives Act, these records should be in the public domain and should be there for everyone to see. There's nothing in any way going to harm anyone in, in terms of sensitivity of these records are released. There's no threat to national security. It's the story of the transfer of land from landlord to tenant. You know, how bad can that be? Um, and part of it is just profound laziness. And part of it is also lack of space in the National Archives. But not, none of these things is insurmountable if somebody wants to do it. I mean, I failed and I'm ashamed of myself. I should have fought much harder, but I did fight pretty hard and didn't get anywhere. Um, so anybody who feels like starting a campaign, you can sign me up. I'm on for it. 